Everyone that is here uh, has made the effort to come out. I know it's also, as we're close to a pool, it's also a great day for swimming. But if you can hold off until after 5 o'clock, that would be great. Uh, I'm Conrad Hurling. I'm fortunate enough to serve as president of the Eleanor and Franklin Roosevelt Democratic Club. And I have a number of folks to acknowledge, but I do want to also acknowledge, besides my two distinguished uh, guests here today, that elected officials uh, we have here in the audience uh, is Nicole Williams, who is one of our representatives to the House of Delegates. And sitting right next to her is Emma Jordan, who is our mayor. Uh, Rick Gordon, who is also a council member of our Greenbelt City Council. Uh, Delegate Julian Ivey from District 47. And then, can you believe it, another Ivey, <laughs> Jolene Ivey, who is a wonderful county council member from District 5. And then, um, Perhaps the longest serving member of our Greenbelt City Council, formerly a mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and council member now, and that would be Jay Davis. So I want to thank everybody for coming to these forums. I'm hoping that you will stay for, for both forums. I want to thank the Greenbrier community staff for setting up this room, Greenbelt Access Television, and Phoebe McFarb, the executive director. And our county cable folks, at least we were in touch with them about covering this event as well. And then also there is, importantly, in the second forum that we're having beginning at three, uh, is the County Council District 4 Candidate Forum Planning Committee. And we have to thank them also for their work setting up the second forum. And also we want to thank, let's see, where did Frank go? Um, Mr. Techie, Frank Kaiser. Uh, oh, it's right there. Oh, hello. I'm sorry. You're, you're, you're not tall enough. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, Frank is great, so we thank him as well. And also my fellow members of the Eleanor and Franklin Roosevelt Democratic Club for putting this all together. It really is teamwork. And, um, and do check at the table as you come in. Uh, as to whether or not you are a member or if you need to update and become, renew your membership or become a member for the first time. We're going to need everybody to, to get the results that we need. It's critically even more important after what's happened at the Supreme Court level. And actually very pleased that for a change, there was something positive that happened with respect to, to, um, to gun control. Um, I'm a member of MOMS, and so I'm really pleased that something positive for a change happened there. And also, I'm going to urge you to register to vote. We do have a registration table in, in the back for more information about that. Um, and I want to also take, just real briefly, uh, to recall, I get a little emotional when I think about him, one line from the recently passed writer and sage Mark Shields who praised a long time, and get this, he praised a long time ago Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill, with these words about him. He was a stranger to self-importance. It is my hope, and I am confident, that each of our candidates have that priceless quality. And now, we're going to go alphabetically initially with her opening comments, sense of things that she's been able to do, her goals for the future, and they will apply, obviously, to, to Mr. Ivey as well. Um, so if uh, former Congresswoman Edwards could begin, it would be great. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Congresswoman Donna Edwards. I represented the 4th Congressional District for five terms, nearly a decade. I am so delighted to be here at the Roosevelt Club and to be with all of you and all of Greenbelt in talking about the issues that concern you. Because after all, this campaign is not about me, it's not about Mr. Ivey, it's about you. 
During the time that I served in Congress, I was really grateful to serve on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, the Science and Technology Committee, the Human Rights um, Committee, all working on issues that are important to those of us who live here in Prince George's County. Um, I got the first funding for the purple line in the infrastructure package that we passed back in 2009-2010. In I delivered after-school suppers to children who received free and reduced breakfast and lunch. I initiated additional funding for our historically black colleges and university, implemented STEM programs, held college fairs, saved thousands of homes from foreclosure. I have a record in this county, and I am proud to run on my record. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I grew up in a military family, lived all across the country and around the world with people who were so unlike my family. In part, I think that that was good training for being a member of Congress. Uh, but we made Prince George's County our home after my dad retired at Andrews Air Force Base. And I've lived here for 40 years, over in Fort Washington and Oxon Hill, shopping at the same grocery store for the last 40 years. And it, for me, being here in Prince George's County is the first time that I found some place that was really home, where I made a commitment to organizing my community, um, helping to organize to make sure that National Harbor was a development that all of us could be proud of and that Prince George's County would benefit from. I worked to make sure that workers who were at National Harbor were able to organize into unions. And as a result, today, most of the hotel workers and restaurant workers over at National Harbor are under union contracts that pay them a living wage and give them benefits and quality of life. And so I am encouraged in this campaign um, to make sure that we stay focused on what's important to you, on the rising gas prices and inflation, on making sure that our infrastructure works for all of our community, and making sure that we get federal resources into um, our schools and school construction. And I know that there's an issue around the clock, so I'm going to close there and just leave this with you, that in this election, it's important for you to think about the candidates, to look at their background, to look at who's supporting them, and then to make a really studied and astute decision about who you want to represent you for the next two years. Thank you very much. Is it going to go down or, or is it up? Just so you still going to have three minutes. Just pay attention to six. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So no buzzer. <laughs> you're going to get a free, get a free one. Just, just All right. Use the, the gong show uh, gong, right? Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Glenn Ivey. I'm the former state's attorney here in Prince George's County running for Congress. Uh, it's great to be back here in Greenbelt. I remember geez, 20 years ago plus, when I first started running for office, being here, I think we were, there was an upstairs part to this that we were uh, meeting in. And uh, so many familiar faces, the great job that you all have continued to do here in Greenbelt. And, you know, it's impressive. It sets a great example for the rest of the county and the region. Um, you know, when I was state's attorney, I came into office in 2002. That was a race about uh, excessive force, police misconduct. That was the top item in the race that year. Um, and we, we won based on the fact that um, the people were concerned about the fact that there had been prosecutions of cops, but they'd been zero for eight in convictions. And so we talked about that in the campaign. There was also public concern about the number of, uh, you know, the violent crime in the county. When I first got into office, we had 172 roughly homicides in that year. Uh, and Oh, it's not running at all? I'm good? All right. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble for using too much time. So I know they don't want me to use too much time either. But uh, OK, all right. Just, just signal when I should stop. All right. OK, so but we had you know, serious violent crime problems in 2002. There's still carryover from the crack war era, the Dodge, Dodge City era. DC was having 450 to 500 homicides a year. 
unfortunately, we were having our share of the same stuff. Uh, and so we did a couple of things, though. There was tension between the prosecutors and the police department, and we needed to make sure we, we diffused that and worked with the police, because, of course, you can't bring convictions for homicide cases, sex assault cases, all of that, you need the police department to do it and work with the, with the prosecutors to get it done. We were able to accomplish that. At the same time, we were also able to hold police accountable and prosecute those many times successfully who would cross the line and violated the, the, the trust that they'd been given uh, by the public. And so we were able to do both. And in addition to that, we were able to also try other things. Instead, of, We knew we couldn't jail our way out of the problem at that point, right? War on drugs we'd already seen wasn't going to work. We already had more than 2.2 million people in jail. We knew that was, we'd passed China in the level of incarcerations. So I thought, well, let's try something a little different. It was controversial at the time. I had people advising me it was, it was, you know, too left, too liberal, whatever. But I said, you know what, let's try intervention and prevention programs. Let's see if we can reach these kids before they get in trouble, or even if they're in trouble already. If they're not in too deep, maybe we can pull them back out. We recognized we had a violent crime issue and we had to prosecute that tough, but we also knew that reentry was going to be necessary because 99.99999% of the people that go to jail are coming out. And the question is, the only question that matters then is, are they going to be ready to become productive members of society or are we just kind of cast them back out expecting a re revolving door to work? So we worked with primarily the faith community. I didn't have any kind of budget for any of these efforts. We got grants, the domestic violence, uh, anti-domestic violence effort that is now the family center down in Upper Marlboro. We teamed up with others and helped to get grant money to, to get that started. Domestic violence, is, just talking about domestic violence was controversial at that point. We launched a program called Project Safe Sunday, reaching out to the faith community. I only had seven churches the first year that would participate. I actually had pastors tell me, Brother Ivy, I don't tell you how to prosecute cases, I'll tell you, I don't have a law degree. You don't have a theology degree. Don't come in here telling me what to do with these churches. But we knew that the faith community had to be a key piece of it. And we also knew that the congregations in, in those churches were going to push more when they heard more about how it worked. And by the end of the process, those churches, many of them, had become key points for pushing back on domestic violence, for uh, people who were in the middle of it finding a way out, support stories that came to support them when they were in that struggle to get out. And so we worked with the faith community, and we built on that, we built on that with the reentry piece, and we, all, we did it with no budget and no money for funding for any of it. We also worked with at-risk kids in an effort to try and keep them from getting in trouble. We started a second grade a reading program that was funded by uh, private sector uh, interests. They helped us get these kids additional reading skills and teaching from, uh, from current public school teachers. We helped them get funding for it, and that worked as well. So, by the end of my eight years, and I don't want to sit here and tell you like I did this by myself because that's clearly not the case, but violent c crime had dropped across the board 30 to 40 percent. We had decades-long uh, lows for the, for, the, for the work that we'd done with respect to homicides and violent crime across the board. So what I'd like to try and do, if I get elected to Congress, and I had a chance to serve on, in Congress under uh, John Conyers, who's a member of the House, uh, Senator Paul Sarbanes, and also Senator Tom Daschle. Um, I'd like to try and bring some of what they taught me about how to run those offices and how to make a difference. There's a couple of things I'm sure we'll get to. This was a tough week, as Conrad mentioned, about from the Supreme Court. Uh, abortion and gun control, I'm sure we'll talk about as we go. My three minutes must have run by now. Uh, so I'll <laughs> okay, so I'll stop. But I look forward to talking to you and accepting your questions as we go forward. Thanks so very much, Mr. Ivey. All right. Um, let me just ask Matt, uh, NGO, Matt, because uh, actually Emmett did bring in some cards that we would use in a traditional sense. This, this timer, just in case, if you could bring those up, Emmett, would greatly appreciate that. Thanks so much. Uh, this timer, um, uh, we're having some. <laughs> <laughs> Old school still works, right? Yeah. Um, so if, if we can't get this going the way, um, Matt will be able to keep track of the time and then use the cards that Emma just brought over so that each of the candidates will know how much time 
that they have left. It's really a shame because there's nothing lovelier than that wonderful buzzer sound <laughs> at the end. And this is a clock that is used for um, our kids' basketball program with the recreation department. I was going to say, I'll have a flashback if I <laughs> so, so anyway, so, so watch Matt with the wonderful signs. And I'm going to go through these questions. Um, the first one is, and you've alluded to this to some degree already, what are the top issues, and we'll start with Mr. Ivey, uh, the, what are the top issues you are focusing on if elected? Well, after the past week, I mean, I think you have to say Roe and abortion. I mean, I think the, the Supreme Court's decision, um, you know, I, I was expecting them to go in that direction because of the leaked uh, version of the draft, but I didn't really think they would, would stay that far and go that far. Um, and now we know that there are going to be states that have, um, uh, you know, no right, to, no right to an abortion, even if you're a victim of rape and incest, even if you're a mother whose life is at risk. Uh, I think it's an insane decision at the end of the day. Uh, and I think it has to be addressed. I think the problem with that, as you know, Mr. Uh, President Biden sort of pointed out last, yeah, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday, there's no easy answer to happen at the congressional level. Um, because we already had a vote a little while ago to try and codify Roe and it failed in the Senate. So we know it's not going to work there, but we also know a couple of things. One is that um, if just because you're a member of Congress doesn't mean you're limited to Capitol Hill. I think we have to make sure we, we do all the fight that we can at every level that we can. Um, street protests that I've seen in the past couple of days I think are going to be critical to continue. Uh, one of the examples with Black Lives Matter after George Floyd's death that really did get things moving was, was uh, continued uh, efforts to continued efforts to try and continued efforts to try and make sure that uh, we kept this on the front burner of the agenda and we kept up public pressure. Uh, and secondly, there are going to be key states where um, it's going to have to be fought out at the legislative level. If you looked at the map, pretty much any, almost anything south of, of Maryland uh, is in play. And all the way over to Colorado, uh, you know, women's rights to choose uh, are, are either at risk or gone already. They'll have trigger amendments to take them out. We've got to fight those at, at, at all of those levels. I think some of the key states we should look at, Virginia, North Carolina are up, uh, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, and Ohio, they're all, uh, and Florida to some extent too. They're all battleground pre presidential states. We can, if we can win those state legislative votes, uh, it can make a difference or at least make sure we have legislation that gives women some kind of, uh, of protection uh, from a right standpoint. And then lastly, as I just mentioned, we're the closest to most of these states uh, from, from in the South. I think Maryland's got to find ways to step up to expand the services we can provide to people because we're going to have people that are women that are going to need to come here in order to have, have a chance to have an abortion. So I think those are the things we need to do with that. 15 seconds. I, there are other things I'd love to do, actually, and this whole panel plea that I would normally have talked about last week. The Supreme Court changed all of that this week. I would, I would like to hit guns next time, too. Right. Thank, thanks so very, very much. Um, Donna Edwards, what, what's your take? Thank you. Um, obviously, there are things that we have to stay focused on because of the time. Uh, as Mr. Ivey has mentioned, the uh, Supreme Court decision last week really changes the ground that all of us work on. And if you read the, um, the majority opinions, it actually suggests that not only um, was Roe dissolved, but it leads to the possible dissolution of marriage equality. It leads to uh, possibly the dissolution of the freedom to marry anyone that we want. And so there's a lot at stake. I was thinking uh, just now that I was um, I came down from New Hampshire when I was in law school with my seven-month-old um, to protest, his first protest, at the March for Women's Lives. And um, I think over the course of these um, last several decades, we've seen a steady erosion of Roe, and it becomes a baseline for organizing uh, here in Maryland and around the country. And more particularly here in, in Prince George's County, I think that we have to be focused on making sure that Prince George's County gets its fair share 
of the infrastructure dollars that were passed by the Congress and now are coming, um, those dollars coming to the state. And we have a lot of infrastructure projects from um, school construction to electrification um, to making certain that we have the kind of infrastructure that can support the development that is happening in this county. We need to focus on job creation around our metro centers, de developing transit-oriented development so that we have mixed-use development at all of those transit uh, stations. And I feel like I'm well positioned, frankly, to go back into the Congress with my seniority and with my experience to be able to deliver on those things. And of course, um, while there's not a lot that can be done about um, right now around rising inflation, and I think the president is taking the steps that he needs uh, to do, we do uh, face the challenge of making sure that all of our families can afford their housing and their daily living expenses here in Prince George's County. So there's a lot uh, to do, and I'm looking forward to getting um, started on that, and the agenda is long, and I'd love to go back in with my seniority, my experience, and the support of the Speaker of the House to make sure to get the job done. Great. Thank you, sir, very much. Um, a reference was made in um, Ms. Edwards' comments, um, and it's been a battle. The very fact that, was it 14 members of the Senate on the Republican side who actually voted for this recent Fifteen. legislation? 15, was it? Um, and that is so rare uh, to get beyond one or two. So here's the question uh, from everyone that's come here, how will you promote bipartisanship in Congress? And we'll, we'll start with uh, former council member Edwards. Well, first of all, I think um, my time in Congress actually demonstrates that I worked across the aisle. Uh, I worked, for example, with Congresswoman Barbara Comstock on issues related to metro safety and security and operations. Uh, I worked with um, my friend from, uh, from Washington State, uh, Jamie Herrera Butler, on issues related to women's health care and to domestic violence as we co-chaired the Bipartisan Women's Caucus. I worked across the line long before I got into Congress with Congresswoman Connie Morella, who's endorsed my campaign on issues related to domestic violence. I was one of the lead organizers on the Violence Against Women Act when it, um, when it passed, making sure that states and localities like Prince George's County got grant, we were able to get grants to create the domestic violence units that Mr. Ivey has talked about. That was from the work that I did. So I feel like I've demonstrated in the work that I've done in the past um, to work across the lines. Some things are bottom lines though, and so we can't trade our values um, when it comes to things that are important to us at the same time, figure out ways that we can work across those lines. In the time since I've been out of Congress, I have been uh, grateful to be the vice chair of the United States Association of Former Members of Congress, which is a bipartisan organization working on issues to challenge Congress to reorganize itself. I've um, been working on a bipartisan group for the reorganization of the of the Congress, working with members from Louisiana and Florida and Texas and other places that um, where we have a relationship across the aisle to promote a common agenda. Um, I've also worked with a group called Issue One, where I recruited Republican members to join Democrats in calling for the elections in 2020 for every vote to be counted. And our voices that were raised together as Republicans and Democrats actually re resulted in a bipartisan call um, for every vote to be counted. And so I think that my history demonstrates that I've worked across the aisle, and I see no reason that that will change on my return to Congress. Thank you very much. Mr. Ivey, uh, tell us about your experiences in a parallel fashion and what you would like to do to see greater bipartisanship in Congress. Well, let me, let me start with some of the things we worked on when I was uh, on the Hill. Um, you know, one of the, the most interesting ones is I was working for Congressman John Conyers, um, and uh, who was one of the most uh, viewed as most one of the left uh, liberal members of the House. Um, and he did a joint piece of legislation with Strom Thurmond, who, uh, you know, was 
Well, I mean, certainly when I was a kid, he was a hardcore segregationist, Dixiecrat, about as extreme as you could get with the Republican Party. They worked out a piece of legislation with respect to alcohol and, you know, warning labels and the like. Uh, and I remember working it, and after we'd, we'd gotten the, the legislation written up and we were trying to float the bill, you know, we went door to door to calling people, and many of them were like, geez, if there's something Conyers and Strom Thurmond can agree on, I know it's okay for me to sign on to it. So the bill flew through uh, on the House and the Senate. But, you know, that's been, a few, that's been a few years, and a lot's changed since then. And, um, you know, we do have occasional changes where you do get that piece of legislation on gun control, where you get the 15 votes on the Republican side. Although I will point out that the 15 are, by and large, people who are not up for election or they're retiring. So as far as people who are members, Republican members of the Senate who are willing to stand up and take a risk, uh, at least from their perceived view, I don't know that 15 is really the number. So I, I mean, I think a couple of things. One is um, um, I, I think what we're going to have to do is recognize what worked with respect to the gun piece. Um, and that is just that it just got so bad, they felt that they had to do it. And McConnell went with it in part because he knew the Supreme Court was going to overturn Roe, and he didn't want both of these on the on the uh, on the agenda for this election cycle. So he he agreed to allow them to take guns off. But let's not let's not kid ourselves. Mitch McConnell is still Mitch McConnell, and we know what he, he what he is, who he does, and you know the way he handles things. So I, I'm under no illusion that this is going to become the path of the future. That's why I mentioned with respect to Roe. Street action, we need constant protests and political pressure in order to push members of the Senate to change their views. And one of the quick pieces on that front is uh, Collins um, saying, like, geez, Kavanaugh, I didn't know he was going to. Now, shock, shocked and appalled, right? But she felt pressure to come out and say, I think he lied to me, in part because, at least in Maine, uh, that had been one of the pressures that she faced when she was up for re-election. We've got to have that kind of pressure that's brought around the country. We're fortunate to be here in Maryland. It's a deep blue state. This, this district is one of the bluest. I think you're in the top five blue. But nationwide, if we're really going to move these issues, and we're going to talk about a bunch today, we've got to make sure we pick up two more senators and put additional pressure on the Republicans that are there who could be swing votes so that they'll come around and support us on things like voting rights and other things. Great, great. Thanks very much. Great question, by the way. Um, here's another. Um, what is your plan to preserve and promote research and development with NASA, Goddard, and Beltsville Agricultural Research Center as a nexus of how we can build our future in the 4th District? Um, I guess I'm up first. Mr. Ivey, yes. Okay. Uh, you know, it's funny. I just got endorsed by um, one of the unions at NASA last week, that is the, the engineers and the scientists. Um, and one of the things they were talking about was trying to build out um, more effort from the state, the county, and also from federal support uh, at, at those kind of efforts. One of the things that I've been talking to people about you know, North Carolina's got a research triangle. Virginia has a research triangle. Prince George's County does, too. We've got NASA, we've got the University of Maryland, and we've got the Agriculture Center, really in very close proximity, um, really seedbeds for research and development, and also for um, the types of scientists, uh, PhD types, all of the folks that we want to have moved to Prince George's County, um, and if they're working here, to hopefully stay in Prince George's County, and to draw more businesses like that uh, to, to Prince George's. A few years ago, I wasn't running for anything, but I ran into a guy who was um, running an A&E business um, near NASA, and he said he was going to move his business. And I said, why? And he said, you know, he didn't feel like he had enough interaction with, with the jurisdiction. He didn't feel like he had ties. Uh, there's other reasons, other places he could go. He didn't live here. And so he moved his business. And a few weeks after that, another one moved too. And so I called that guy up and asked the same question, got the same answer. So I called some of the, the officials at the time to reach out to him. I said, what are we doing to keep these businesses here? And a couple of things. One of them was not an elected official, but one of the business community leaders. He didn't even know about these businesses. And he hadn't thought in terms of keeping these businesses here as such a great basis 
for economic development for the county with the types of jobs we want. I think we've got to change that. I'd, I'd just be a member of Congress. It's not something you legislate, but it's something that you can build on here. And I've heard it from other business leaders, too. Bazuto over here at um, uh, one of the biggest national uh, development companies in the world is based in Greenbelt. And he was about to move out of the county, um, you know, not NASA related, but a lot of great jobs. And you, you might not have noticed, but you look at buildings around the region, including the one my oldest son lives, lives in, Bazuto built that building. He was ready to move out too. And it just so happened I was meeting with him and, and he brought it up. And I said, why are you moving? Well, I'm getting better offers for deals in other places. And I said, well, have you talked to anybody here? He said, he had reached out and nobody had responded. So I got on the phone, made a call. Uh, about 15 minutes later, the right folks made the conversation. And as you can see, the building he's in now, he wasn't in. He was in a different building over on Walker Road. He, he moved into that building, gutted it, restructured it out. And now we have, uh, I think, hundreds of employees that he, he has there that are architects, engineers, and the like. There's a lot of things we can do to not only keep businesses here, but expand it. And if we market it right and work on a, a you know, face to face level, we can get it done. And now, Donna Edwards, what's your take on this? Thank you. Well, first of all, I, I, for those of you who don't know, I spent eight years um, working uh, through Building 23 over at Goddard Space Flight Center. I was a systems engineer for Lockheed working in the space program. And so I have a real soft spot uh, for Greenbelt, for NASA, and for the work that's done there. I served for um, nine and a half years on the Science and Technology Committee, and one of my roles there was to make sure that we continued um, funding and support for Goddard Space Flight Center. You will recall that because Goddard does a lot of work around Earth sciences, that um, there were Republican members who wanted to zero out Earth sciences funding because they viewed it as working on climate change, and I stopped that. Um, and so I, I look at our county, and I think that we have so many great reserves. Senator Mikulski and I worked on getting resources into the University of Maryland for the cybersecurity work that's being uh, done there. And so we do have a, a regional hub for, uh, for technology. We can be a technology corridor in the same way that um, Route 270 is a biotech uh, corridor because of the resources that we have here in the county. And I look forward to going back in and knowing what I know about uh, science and technology, both from my early training, but also from the work that I did um, uh, on the Science and Technology Committee. I feel really confident in being able to be a, a strong advocate uh, for the work that has to be built out here in Prince George's County. And again, I think that our transportation infrastructure, the infrastructure hub of our metro centers, um, makes this county one of the few places in the Washington region where there are opportunities for positive economic development and growth. And of course, the Agricultural Resource cent uh, Research Center is really an important component of that and making sure that, you know, we look at um, food security around the world, the research that's being done there actually can um, help us figure out those things, not just for the United States, but for the rest of the world. And so that is work that I think is really Im Im important to do. And then lastly, of course, we shouldn't forget the other resources that we have around technology. I spent some time um, at NASA working with their contracting offices and with the contracting officers over at Andrews Air Force Base, Joint Base Andrews, um, to ensure that some of our small businesses were getting the availability of those contracts. And so I look forward to continuing that work in my next term in Congress. Great. Thank you very much. And I'm glad that you raised the issue of food and hunger. Uh, each year, members of our Democratic Club uh, does join in uh, in the efforts with the uh, crop walk at uh, Lake Artemisia. So that's a really, well, it's obviously it's an important issue, but it's too often it gets overlooked. Uh, let me ask uh, former council member Edwards this question. Would you introduce a tax on Wall Street profits to pay for the trial tax credit to con and, 
and to help. I'm sorry. Yes, I was about to say that, but, but thanks for the reinforcement. Yes, yeah, so for those two purposes, for um, to pay for the child tax credit and to pay for combating climate change. Well, first of all, we have um, an opportunity, I think, especially um, with the, um, the corporate profits tax um, by initiating a, um, a bottom line minimum tax for for corporations by ensuring that we are taxing offshore um, uh, profits that are being made for companies that are based here in the United States, but who take their profits offshore so that they can avoid, avoid paying taxes here in the U.S. And so I think there's actually a lot that we can do with corporate uh, taxes, including the child tax credit, paying for what we need to do now um, for uh, climate change. Um, and to address the climate crisis, but also for health care um, and ensuring that we can expand um, Medicare for all, and we need those resources to be able to, um, to do that. And, you know, the fact is that we have um, millionaires and billionaires who are not paying their fair share in taxes, and we need to make sure that all of that comes into the Treasury so that we can meet the needs of the American people. Um, and I am, you know, proud of the work that I'm doing with the Committee to Preserve Social Security and Medicare so that we can make sure that those systems are shored up for, um, for the future. And um, to have the support of the teachers who know that we need to put money into, um, into education as well. So I'm looking forward to, um, to getting back into Congress and getting to work and joining a growing um, coalition in the United States House of Representatives um, supported principally uh, through the Progressive Caucus that supports these kind of corporate um, tax reforms in order to meet the needs of the American people. And it is why the Congressional Progressive Caucus has endorsed my campaign to return to Congress. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Ivey? Um, the, what were the two? It said tax Wall Street for what? Climate change? And what was the other it one? It was... Um, uh, child tax credit to help pay for the child tax, tax credit as well as to combat climate change. Um, okay. I think the short answer is yes, depending on how you structured the tax. But, um, uh, and I don't think we, I think it's fo focused on Wall Street. I, obviously, I think we can go beyond that. So, uh, President Biden, I think, is, you know, there, there are variations that have been proposed, but increasing personal income tax. Uh, I think you cut, you drew the line at 400,000, but, you know, I think the point of, you know, when you go higher than that, uh, you could go up to 29%, and I think in the Reagan era, it was 30% uh, for income tax. So th I think that would be a one place to go, and I think there are other options for where uh, to try and find additional revenue uh, to help fund a lot of these programs. The child tax credit, um, which I think is moving right now, uh, and I think there's additional um, funding that's needed for that. They're talking about scaling it down, um, which I think is based in part on the revenue and pay fors. Or, but uh, I think it's it's a critical program. It seems to be extremely effective, uh, and you know, I think it's I want to say it's like three hundred dollars a month is the idea uh, for it. Currently, I think the the records show that it's been great for families. The Republicans have raised concern about you know they're going to misuse the money, you're going to use it to buy drugs and all this kind of stuff. Uh, that's not been borne out by the research. What has been borne out is that, that parents, usually mothers, use the, use the funds to buy food, pay rent, and, um, and clothing for the kids. So I'm all in favor of it. It seems like a great program that we need to have in place. And it supports a lot of the low-income efforts that have been put in place over the years. Um, that have been scaled back under the Trump administration to some extent and that needed to be expanded anyway. With respect to climate change, I think um, those kinds of taxes are fine. I think there are other ways to generate revenue that are related to uh, energy. I know it's a challenge right now because um, gas prices are so high. In fact, they're dangerously high for uh, you know President Biden. He's getting stuck with uh, having to to take responsibility for those those costs, although I think we know it's Russia and Ukraine in part, it's inflation in part, it's supply chain, chain issues in part. There's a lot of challenges going on with that. But I think we have to try and find ways to make sure that uh, within the industry, within the fuel and the, the uh, energy industry, we have the right tax incentives that encourage the appropriate uses of 
you know, solar, wind, and other renewables, um, and also to the extent there, there are taxes that are being used there. He's talking about a tax holiday. I, I, I got to say, I've got concerns about that because it's only short term and it's not really going to seem to make a difference but, uh, in the long run. But, but I think that we need to look at making sure that we get the, the energy um, uh, support for uh, positive energy programs that are funded through dollars from uh, f fossil fuel and the like. Great. Thank you both. All right. These two I'm going to connect together because they are related uh, to each other. And I think you can see already the evidence of this statement that's made by the questioner. We have talented candidates in this primary, both of you, to strengthen, not divide, our Democratic Party will each pledge to support whomever wins our primary, and then a connected question to that. Please respond to the negative TV ads. Please give candidates, well, the, the urge, urge, urgent message from the questioner is to give both candidates a chance to respond. So, Glenn, Mr. Ivey? Okay, the first question was what? Now? The first question is, obviously, two, the both of you are extremely talented. Oh, will I support the nominee? Right. Yes. Uh, and, you know, I right. ran in 2016, Anthony Brown won, I supported him. Um, I've supported people who've run in other races, um, like for Sharon Baker previously ran for governor. I, he lost, I supported the nominee. So that's, that's an easy one. Uh, with respect to the negative ads, negative, yeah. um, you know, I've run ads that are, you know, talk primarily about me and what we've done. The thing I gave you in the initial pitch, I think, is roughly what the ad is. The negative ads, quote unquote, are run by uh, an independent expenditure group. Um, and, you know, I, I'll say this about it. Uh, I think that the ads are true. I think they're verifiably true. And I'll, I'll talk about a couple of them. One is the thrust of the ads is that um, Ms. Edwards had a bad record for constituent services when she was in Congress. Um, and the ad, as I recall it, has articles from 2012, 2016, and 2022, which was the one that endorsed me. All of those quotes were lifted directly from the Washington Post articles. And all of those quotes were um, written by the Washington Post. I think all three were editorials. But the bad constituent services issue, Ms. Edwards ran against um, Chris Van Hollen in 2016, this issue came up. I thought it was thoroughly vetted at the time. I don't, in fact, I don't, I don't think there was any doubt about how much it was covered at the time. And I think that's where it came out, and I think that's why the Washington Post continues to say she had a problem with constituent services. Ms. Edwards has said during this cycle, back when we had a, another one of these debates at Riderwood, where she sort of acknowledged that she'd had a problem and pledged to do better. And it looks like in the editorial that endorsed me, she said that to the Washington Post editorial board. And in the Washington Post editorial where she announced her endorsement with Ms. Pelosi, and I think from one of the unions, one of the union members said that too. So I, I really just don't think that there's, there's much dispute about whether she had a problem with constituent services or not. I think it, it was clearly the case. So um, in my view, you know, the way democracy works is you give people the information they need to make their decisions. To me, constituent services couldn't be a more central part of the function that a member of Congress can provide. As the questions we talked about a few minutes ago point out, there's a lot of things that are beyond your control on Capitol Hill. You know, inflation, I don't know what's going to happen with, with uh, Ukraine and gas prices that are driven by that, or wheat prices and the like. But I know that when somebody calls and they've got a problem and they've got, they can't get their benefits or whatever from the federal government, I know I can help with that. In fact, I'm not even in office right now and I still get these calls. I still help people out. It's something that I did when I was state's attorney, when people were, their, their son had been shot or they'd just gotten through a gang rape or something. Constituent service is what I've done for my entire career and even in my life in the private sector. All right, thank you. Ms. Edwards. First of all, let me say that I think that the ads that are being run and the mail that's being sent from an organization that is principally funded by the American Israel Politi uh, Public Affairs Committee are reprehensible. 
and I think that any candidate who's benefiting from them should disavow those ads. Uh, I will also say that this is an organization that is spending $200,000 a day to affect the election here in Prince George's County. Um, it is being supported by people who are from Arizona and Tennessee and New York and California and every place but here in Prince George's County or even in Maryland. Um, the ads are false and they are misleading. Um, indeed, Mr. Ivey endorsed me in 2016 in the face of those same things when I ran for the United States Senate. Mr. Ivey served as my campaign treasurer in 2018 when the same allegations were made. He didn't express those concerns now, but he has signaled to this independent, so-called independent expenditure that he simply cannot divorce himself from, from the $200,000 a day that are being spent here in Prince George's County. The organization that's also spending that money um, has endorsed and supported 109 Republicans who voted to not to certify the election in 2020. I think it is reprehensible that money like that, Republican money, um, is being spent, insurrection money is being spent here in Prince George's County to benefit Mr. Ivey. As to, the, um, as to the assertions that were made, I think any member of Congress, and I've talked to a number of my former colleagues, can tell you that um, it is one of the most challenging things to do. When I first came into, into office, um, I was the first member of Congress in the country to conduct uh, foreclosure events for people who were losing their homes. We saved thousands of homes here in Prince George's County from foreclosure. Um, students who hadn't had the opportunity to be exposed to college, we conducted college fairs for those students for every single year that I served. Hundreds of students offered uh, scholarships in order to, uh, to complete their education. I worked with uh, teachers to provide meals uh, for students in school. Now, is there work that can be improved? Absolutely, that is always, always true. Um, but for this outside entity to come into Prince George's County and vow to spend $200,000 a day from now until um, July 19th is reprehensible, and Mr. Ivey should disavow them. And, and uh, Council, uh, former Council Member Edwards, um, on the other question, um, do you pledge to um, support the candidate? Of course, I, will al I have always supported the nominee of my party. Okay, those are the, the questions that, um, and I want to thank our crew over to my left, and all of you, because those, those questions come from you. And there's one thing that I know, I mean, I've lived in Greenbelt since I was 10 months old. I know Greenbelt. And, and uh, I always love to say so, that. So you've been here 30 years, is that the? That is, well, 31. <laughs> there are 31 plus. But, um, and I can tell you, actually, you know, I was born in Yonkers. And speaking of the issue regarding uh, a woman's choice, I mean, um, my mom, who actually did perform some of the abortions, um, and they talk about should it be only doctors that do this or people. My mom was a, a nursing; she was a nurse, um, so she was qualified to do that. But I was cesarean, and I was uh, ten days late. Now, some people have told me that that uh, is a pattern that's continued with my life; that I always tend to be a little late. <laughs> Uh, but fortunately, my mom uh, hung in with me, and um, I am so glad that I live in Greenbelt because it is a community of people that care. Um, and um, I think all of us, and I really appreciate the questions that have uh, come forth. Um, I have one additional question, and then I want both candidates to have the opportunity to mix with you uh, before the next forum that's coming with our uh, candidates for the county council. And this may be a little bit off target, but I know that it's definitely a concern that I have. I mean, we talk about the possibility as to whether or not, um, you know, we would, um, uh, in Greenbelt, 
have the new facility or would it be in the southern part of the county? We kind of go back and forth. In either case, the county would, would benefit from that. But one of the things that's actually become some bit of an issue has been you know, this idea of building a new stadium for the football team. While, of course, at the same time, there are questions that might be coming up from Congress with respect to the, uh, at least alleged, I'll be on the safe side, um, bad side of his behavior of the owner of the team. How do you feel about having, because um, it's been in Prince George's County for, what, about 15 years or so? No, longer um, than that. I mean, it, it came way in Curry. But, is it more like 20, yeah. Yeah, 2020s? Like yeah. yeah. So how do you feel about that? I actually have written to the county executive about that and said, I feel, and this is just me speaking, that professional sports teams belong in cities. So like when the Detroit Pistons moved out of Detroit, you know, within five years, it really didn't quite work and they came back as part of the rebuilding of Detroit. How do you, how do you feel about um, this, this issue and, and what do you see possibly, what I wrote to uh, the county executive was that wherever the stadium would be, with or without a stadium, that area can become an area for new, the new jobs, the new economy. Um, and then Prince George's County can then be a leader to the country about these new jobs and also to, as part of that, build affordable housing so people can walk to work. Prince George's County, people that live here, we spend more time driving to and from work than any of the other jurisdictions in our area. How do you feel about, about this idea, maybe generally, and then specifically, do you, do you feel this, where do you, what possibilities do you see coming from this? I think Ms. Edwards is first this time. Thank you. Sure. Um, um, thank you for the thoughtfulness. Um, as a rule, I don't believe that taxpayers should be subsidizing major sports fran franchises. The Washington um, Commanders are one of the they're one of the most lucrative you, sports franchises in the country. Um, Daniel Snyder can afford to build his own stadium wherever it is that he gets permission to build it, and taxpayers should not be subsidizing it. We could use uh, that money to meet all of the uh, various needs that we have around education and law enforcement and housing um, and other needs of this, of this county. I also think that the, um, the area that we're talking about um, where the Landover Mall site um, is and here in Greenbelt. Um, in the time that I served on the Transportation Infrastructure Committee, I was like a dog with a bone when it came to pressing the uh, General Services Administration to make sure that Prince George's County was at the top of the list for consideration of the FBI headquarters. And whether that is going to be in Central County at the old Landover Mall site or here in Greenbelt, it needs to happen in Prince George's County. 45% of the workers um, of the FBI drive from Prince George's County to go to their 24 different facilities around the metropolitan region. We need those jobs and all of the attendant jobs that would happen um, here in the county. Uh, I also believe that people should you know, live and work where they play. And we have the opportunity for that because of the number of metro stations that we have um, in, the, um, in the system around which we can develop housing and commercial use and, and other facilities. Uh, there are about 5,000 uh, federal leases that are going to come up over these, this next decade. And when those are consolidated, it will be important for Prince George's County to be first in line uh, for, those, for those facilities. In fact, I worked um, on the infrastructure committee in getting a resolution passed that requires the General Services Administration to consider co-location with transportation infrastructure for the relocation of those facilities. That is work that I did, that is legislation that I passed, and the goal now would be to make sure that it gets enforced so that Prince George's County gets its fair uh, share of that kind of 
kind of development. And as far as I'm concerned, you can implode FedEx Field um, and deliver something for Prince George's County that is going to be used all the time, 24-7, uh, to make sure that it is an amenity for this county. Great. Thanks very much. Mr. Mr. Ivey. Well, I think uh, a couple of things. One is it's instructive now that um, DC has basically said we're not going to uh, buy RFK and, or take over RFK, so the chance to move there isn't going to be available. And the opportunity to move to Virginia, the Virginia legislature came out real strong to try and get them, but then they backed off. They, they got some blowback because they were offering so much money. So Snyder's kind of in a box, I think. He, he's got to stay where he is for at least five years, and he's bought a lot of land around the stadium. Mm -hmm. I think in part it's clearly not to develop it because he's owned it long enough to start doing it and he hasn't. Uh, I think it's just to make sure you got the parking revenue so people couldn't buy up something and then sell the spots for, for parking later. But what I think we can do is say, look, um, in a nice way, you really don't have any place else to go. You're going to have to stay here at FedEx Field for the next five years. Um, we'd like to see, if you want to stay, you're going to have to pay to build your own stadium. But more importantly to me, you're going to have to do something with all that land that you built around that because it's a gigantic swath of land that connects up at the bottom with the blue line, uh, the Garrett, Mer uh, I forget the name, Garrett something. But the, okay, there's a blue line stay, stop at the, at, at the bottom of that, and you've got rel relatively affordable housing that tracks down straight from there. And the north of it, you have definitely affordable housing. So we've got that in place, but you've got this giant swath that goes all the way over to, to, to the beltway, and, and goes up towards the DC line uh, that we could, we could really build something out with. County execs come up with proposals that I think would, would, would really uh, take advantage of that. Even if he doesn't put the stadium, we can build on the, the metro site and take advantage of that and build it out. And I think you end up with something very positive either way. But giving him money to stay, we don't have to give him incentives to come back. Really, he needs to give us the incentives to stay. I've got a minute left. I, I want to go back to the question about um, where I was accused of reprehensible behavior a moment ago. I, I just want to say this. Um, I, don't, I feel like the, the ads that we've run have been verifiably true. Look at the ad. It's got the citations on it. Pull up the Washington Post articles and read through them and judge for yourself. Uh, and with respect, as, as far as the money goes, um, you know, Ms. Edwards has received millions of dollars in independent expenditures in her campaigns over the years, too. Uh, and I was, I supported her on one of them, yes, and I was her treasurer on the second one, but I never said anything about I think it's fine or not with respect to that. The point is right now she's saying I should disavow independent expenditures. Uh, she didn't at the time when she was the getting the money. All I'm saying now is if, if you didn't want to disavow it then, don't ask me to do it now, especially for truthful ads. And the ads that she ran, for example, called Ms. Also Brooks, uh, accused her of pay to play, which the Washington Post said was false. So my ads have been true, her ads were not, they were both independent expenditures. Pull it up on, uh, on Google and draw your own conclusion. Okay, well I want to thank both candidates and I want to provide both candidates uh, an opportunity to make closing uh, statements. So, uh, Mr. Ivey and then um, former council member Edwards. Mr. Oh, Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, did I make an error? I'm not afraid to admit that I made an error. Um, it happens once a decade, but. Yeah. It's, that's correct, and again, I'm only 31. I think it's Mr. Ivey going first because I went first to start. Well, I was just going by where we were in the seat. I, I can go first, it's okay. Um, look, I, I think uh, we've, we've talked through a lot of the issues that, um, that we care about. Uh, there's not enough time to do it all in an hour. Uh, I mentioned earlier the gun decision the Supreme Court came down with. I'm very pleased about the Senate moving forward with gun restrictions, uh, although they're very limited. Uh, and, and I'm worried that the, the, it's kind of a screen for the Supreme Court to do more that's negative on that front. Because basically what the Supreme Court said to Maryland and six other states is, you really can't limit people from carrying concealed guns. They, can, they have a, almost a right to get a concealed weapon and carry it whenever, if they're over 18, they can carry it. I think that's wrong. I think it's dangerous for us as a community. Gun control is one of the things we focused a lot on when I was state's attorney. Uh, I, I was on the Heller brief, actually the lead on it was um, 
uh, the, uh, uh, an amicus brief, a friend of the court brief. Um, the vice president was the lead at the time, and we teamed up with her and several other prosecutors. But this is exactly the kind of stuff we raised at the time. We're going to have to find ways. We can't rely on the court to play it straight anymore. It's going to have to happen uh, in the political arenas, uh, either in the federal piece, when we can find a few Republicans in the Senate who will come and join us, uh, and at the state court levels, uh, because uh, the, the state legislative levels, because that was, that's where it needs to be fought. The big issues I've focused on uh, in my campaign so far, uh, really trying to find a way to deal with the crime piece. I think we did a lot of uh, uh, you know, intervention and prevention efforts that were not based on my role as state's attorney or limited to that. There's a lot you can do with a platform like a, as a member of Congress. You're really not limited to just legislation on Capitol Hill. The things that you can do that are positive, especially helping people out when they need it. You don't need legislation every time somebody's got a challenge to help them fix it. You don't need to, you know, seniority or committee assignment to help somebody out when they can't get the benefits they need. And when they're having trouble finding food or getting assistance, a lot of time all they need is somebody who understands the government and how it works and you point them in the right direction. And even sometimes on top of that, you can say, hey, my name's Glenn Ivey, tell them I sent you. And that's enough for them to at least get their foot in the door so that they get the, the process started. We can do these kinds of things. And we can build out these, these sort of efforts as well here in the county. With, we're talking about uh, the police reform task force, for example. The county executive, Angela Also Brooks, put me on that. Um, you know, we didn't have any legislative specific roles for that, but we came up with proposals that made a lot of sense as far as pretextual stops and limiting that, stopping the focus on young black males just because they're driving cars, which one of my kids got stopped right here in Greenbelt under, the, under those circumstances. We can find ways to fight those things. We got to do it on Capitol Hill, but it's, it's not just a day job. We can do that here at home and make a difference here with the authority and the power you entrust us with us. So I ask for your vote uh, on July 19th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Donna Edwards, yes, with your closing statement. Well, first of all, thank you all very much for those really thoughtful questions today um, and to the Roosevelt Club for hosting us and Greater Greenbelt for listening to us. Uh, this afternoon, and I appreciate that my opponent is here and that we together were able to ask and to answer the questions that you have. Uh, I'm asking you for your vote on July 19th to return to the Congress uh, to continue the work of the people here in Prince George's County and uh, our sliver of Montgomery County that's represented of the 4th Congressional District to make sure that we can continue to deliver jobs and opportunity um, to build on the, the support that we give to our, our students and our educators and our, our parents to work with our local elected officials, especially in including uh, the mayors of which there are a lot of mayors, a couple of dozen of them in the 4th uh, congressional district, we have to make sure that the resources we have at the federal level that come to the state and the county make their way also to our municipalities to meet their needs for water infrastructure, for transportation, uh, for all of the services that are delivered in our municipalities. Uh, I think that there is a reason that Speaker, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is supporting my campaign. You can go on to our website and see in her words because she believes and she knows that I was an effective member of Congress representing Prince George's County. And so don't believe the hype. Listen to the Speaker of the House. Um, you can hear on Tuesday Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton in support of my campaign because she knows that I was an effective member of, of Congress. Um, Whip Clyburn, who supported my campaign as well, the former um, chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, Barbara Lee, who is supporting my campaign as long as, as well as a lot of our local elected officials from Senator Penske to uh, Nicole Williams to Melanie Griffith and all across this, um, this great county. We have a lot of challenges in front of us. We need to be able to hit the ground running going into this next Congress. Um, not the least of the challenges are the challenges to our democracy and making sure that we preserve and protect this republic even as we deliver um, locally for, uh, for Prince George's County. We want to bring home that FBI headquarters and any other job centers that we can create 
here in Prince George's County. And so I am looking forward to going back into Congress, to continuing to serve and to deliver for the people of our county and of our congressional district, and to working with our leadership to ensure that we are properly delivering uh, for the people of this nation. Uh, and so I thank you very much for your attention this afternoon. I ask you for your vote on July 19th or during the early voting period on July 7th. And uh, thank you again for having us this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, now feel free to schmooze. And then the next uh, program won't be beginning until three, so you've got time to interact with two really good candidates. Thanks so much. Thank you.